for watching Taxpayer Alert. This is our, oh, quite a few numbers, quite a few in our series now. We're up getting close to 100. And it's such a pleasure because I get a chance to interview some of the most intelligent, informed people in the county. And we think it's a real blessing for the taxpayers. And this is sponsored by the Calaveras County Taxpayer Association, and um, which you're welcome to join. And Tonight is no exception. We have our county auditor, Rebecca Gallon. Rebecca, welcome here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. Now, this is um, perhaps your third time, and every time you've just loaded with information for the taxpayers and for the public. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I understand that uh, uh, you're, you're first not planning on running again for office, mm -hmm. but you changed your mind. And uh, tell us about that. Um, so uh, I, I had started considering not running for office last year, and uh, it was interesting because I had an interview with you, and you said, you're running for office, right? And I just said, you know, I said yes, and I went home, and I thought, why exactly am I running for office again? Uh, it had just kind of hit a point where I didn't feel like I was effectuating change. I didn't feel like my office was being heard. Um, there was a lack of civility that my entire office was feeling, uh, it, and we just couldn't make changes. We were not being included in the discussions, um, and, I, and I saw a lot of problems come from that, and um, kind of a, a pulling away of my authority in my office, and a misunderstanding of what the role of auditor controller was, and I didn't feel like... Um, I could necessarily continue going down that road unless things changed drastically. In the last um, a little over a month, there's been a lot of things happening in the background, a lot of discussions happening with uh, staff, whether it be administrative, board of supervisors, just kind of kind of coming back together and saying, you know, do you understand what my role is? Do you understand the role of my department? Do you understand that I don't answer to the board? I don't answer to the CAO. Uh, I answer to the people. And so that is uh, very important for people to understand because I'm not the one that's probably going to be the bearer of great news all the time. I'm usually the one that's criticizing internal controls or we have a problem um, or I, I see a, a, an issue with this or that, and that can be um, off-putting for some people. Um, but if you look at it from uh, the perspective that auditor controllers in the state of California are really representing, the, we're the watchdogs. Mm -hmm. we're, we're watching the taxpayers' dollars, making sure that we are being good stewards of your dollars, of our dollars, and making sure the internal controls are followed, then as long as everybody understands that, um, then I think we can work together effectively. Uh, it's when there is this idea that, you know, I'm undermining or that I'm trying to, uh, you know, create conflict or create problems, um, which that really isn't the case. I, I don't um, get any personal benefit or gratification by, you know, outing something that's going wrong. Mm -hmm. I, um, you know, I'm looking for solutions. So the last month, there's been a lot of discussions, and I feel that the relationships are being mended. There is a strong effort to work better and more collaboratively with my office. So because of that, um, and I've had hundreds of people uh, <laughs> in all walks of life, whether well, it's taxpayers. a grocery store, yes, taxpayers, <laughs> that said, oh, gosh, please, please reconsider. You know, there was a lot of um, concern what would happen if I wasn't there. 
Um, and that was a concern of mine as well, but so was my mental health. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, I, I feel like there's been some positive changes um, and some um, respectful conversations. And so because of that, I will be um, pursuing that reelection campaign. The, um, the CAO uh, had, uh, I guess, several uh, meetings with uh, department heads mm -hmm. and supervisors on finding ways for better communication mm -hmm. and working together rather than opposing each other to to uh, mm -hmm. to provide a better product for mm -hmm. the for the public yes and uh, and I, I think some of this is paying off the principles that are used uh, are actually pretty fairly well known they're uh, uh, it's a form of uh, <clears throat> not thought control, but um, uh, a way of changing your thinking mm -hmm. to uh, head off reacting. Right. Instead of reacting, to listen better, mm -hmm. and then and then uh, to apply a positive attitude. Yep. And uh, I kind of I kind of see the same thing you're saying. Mm -hmm. that you always will have grumpy people, mm -hmm. but they're there for a purpose. Right. It uh, they're there so you can appreciate the other people better. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Well, well, so so glad to see you back. Yep. And, um, and it should be an interesting campaign. Yes. Uh, now, the next, uh, one of the biggest items, of course, is uh, uh, the commercial uh, uh, cultivation ban. And um, our last interview I think we have with you, you showed some of the numbers about that and that the county had actually been dependent upon this money mm -hmm. to balance its books, mm -hmm. and with uh, uh, <clears throat> with with the po potential loss of that, then there, has, there could be people being laid off, mm -hmm. and uh, it could be fairly serious. Yes. So, uh, what do you see is happening now with that? Um, well, the reality is that uh, you know, as assuming that the 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 beyond everything goes through um, and there's no delays on that and we're continuing forward, there would be an end of the program. Um, and so, again, you know, there were discussions about putting uh, items on the ballot and depending on how the voters are going to vote. You know, we, it, again, it's one of these periods of time that we're not entirely positive if it's going to go right or if it's going to go left in exactly how do we uh, decide how much revenue we're going to have or not have. So at this point, with a BN looming, we're all having meetings to discuss, you know, what are going to be the impacts, the knowns, and, uh, you know, how much money is remaining and how much do we think is going to be there and how many positions are out there. Um, and we've got positions that were created, but they're not necessarily filled. So we've got vacancies. Um, so it's kind of getting through all of that data and trying to determine um, the, the different outcomes of the two pathways. The one path is related to the regulatory program, the commercial cultivation um, license program, and the other one was related to the Measure C dollars. There's a lot of restrictions on the use of their regulatory dollars, and there isn't restrictions on the Measure C dollars. Right. However, we did balance the budget with Measure C dollars. We did... Um, build up our budget this fiscal year with Measure C dollars. And so trying to hammer through uh, where we're going to land is kind of a, a tight rope walk, if you will, at this point. So there's a lot of discussions going on, um, a lot of meetings that are happening, a lot of forecasting to try to determine where we're going to land with this thing. So at this point, it's kind of early to tell how far we can go, um, but there's definitely going to be some shrinkage of our budget. Um, I just don't know exactly what that's going to look like yet. And w w I understand that there, most of the uh, discussion has been on uh, two avenues. One was uh, a ban and the mm -hmm. other one was uh, uh, regulation. Mm -hmm. And then in the regulation area, we had... Uh, uh, ban light, where you you impose restrictions in the regulations mm -hmm. that prevent people from going into the business mm -hmm. because it has maybe a hundred acre minimum right. parcel size or right. or five hundred feet uh, distance from the right. property line, right. and just kind of wipes everybody out. Right. And so now at the last uh, board uh, board of supervisors meeting, 
discussing this issue, which was devoted to this issue, um, they they suggested after voting for a ban, they suggested that uh, this be turned over to the voters mm -hmm. with uh, with two choices for the ban and the uh, and regulation. Mm -hmm. But uh, the suggestion was made that if if um, if there was going to be a suggestion for, I mean, a, a voter choice for regulation, it needs to be the one that was approved by the Planning Commission, mm -hmm. which seems to be almost doable, mm -hmm. where it, it isn't a, really a ban in disguise as a regulation. And um, so it remains to be seen if that's really going to get out to the voters or not. Right. And I think there's... Uh, a majority of the board right now would would probably want not want to see that option for the voters to look at. Correct. And yeah. So on the other on the other side, there's looks like there's litigation coming, quite a bit of it, on the ban, and also based on taking money from from people and not giving them back to them, mm -hmm. uh, but not allowing to have the, what they paid for, mm -hmm. and which is uh, pretty fundamental in, uh, in the business community. Yep. You, you have to keep your word. <laughs> yeah. So all of those things are being looked at, and, yeah. and I think that uh, governments in general are sued uh, over everything. So uh, litigation related to cannabis, it, you know, we have litigation all the time. So it'll be interesting to see how all that plays out. Um, the, you know, the concern that I have with voter initiatives is that it is what it is. So whatever passes from a voter initiative perspective, especially mm. when you're talking about a land use um, consideration, we're pretty restricted to what the language is. Right. And um, the, the, the problem that I have with it is that we really struggle trying to implement the urgency ordinance overall. And of course, we all recognize that there were things that um, could have worked better and some things that did work okay. And But it, it, having it locally approved gives us that ability to ebb and flow based mm -hmm. on resources, um, whether it's additional staffing that needs to happen or um, increasing fees or whatever it is. Well, when a voter initiative happens, it's pretty locked, yeah. right? Um, that's the concern I have with voter initiatives because it doesn't give us that flexibility at a local level. You have to, with, go, back you have to go back to the for, vote. Yeah, go back to another initiative. And that makes me extremely nervous because yeah. we've really struggled um, over the last year and a half just trying to do what we had um, in that urgency ordinance. So it, it's it's just another one of those kind of we're waiting to see what exactly is going to happen. Um but all we can deal with at this point is what we do know. And right. what we do know is that the board passed a ban. Right. Um, that means that there will be um, an end to the commercial cultivation uh, program as we know it. The urgency ordinance um, ends on February 14th. If there's not a stay. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just going to be kind of one of those things where I feel every year we're, we're whether it was the, you know, urgency ordinance or it was Butte Fire or it's Winter Storm or Tree Mortality, it's, well, we got to get through this one thing to try to, before we kind of right. level out and then figure out where we're going to go from there. So I think it's another one of those periods of time where we're going to have a really difficult time trying to trend out or um, guess what's going to come down the pipeline. Pretty hard to guess. <laughs> uh, I don't have that good of a crystal ball. <laughs> there was a third suggestion, and that was uh, to actually have the county just drop any uh, uh, cannabis ordinances or regula regulations based on cannabis, allow the state regulations to rule. It wouldn't, state re regulations then would take over. Mm -hmm. And then uh, as far as uh, land use, this can be handled under CEQA, mm -hmm. which is uh, uh, a planning process that we do anyway for all other businesses. Mm -hmm. And so when cannabis appears in the uh, zoning codes, it can be handled. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't, it's not really complicated. And I think they're already doing that in combination with trying to do an ordinance. Mm -hmm. So part of the ordinance is uh, uh, doing things uh, under the planning commission and, and the zoning code, and the other part is to have an, an overriding law mm -hmm. on top of that. Yeah. And so uh, from what I understand from, uh, 
from the industry, it looks like the uh, there's going to be a number of, uh, a number of lawsuits, and the county is probably going to have them all together, mm -hmm. uh, and rather than have to have separate um, issues and trials, right. because I understand it's a hundred thousand dollar allowance for uh, legal, right. and if you have. Ten, well, that hundred thousand, it's going to be a million, mm -hmm. and that money has to come from somewhere. Right. Yep. And uh, so, now that's going to be interesting. Yeah. Yep. And uh, um, I, I can't see any simple solutions um, with what we have working now. No. Uh, but we'll we'll uh, we'll keep tuned and and report to the taxpayers and uh, try to. Uh, yeah, stay stay abreast of it. Yep. So I am. Uh, yeah. So I am in in a lot of those meetings, and we are looking at it from a fiscal perspective, from an operational perspective. Um, we've include all of the departments that would be impacted, including the sheriff's department, and um, what they're seeing. And the reality is, even um, if if commercial cultivation completely goes away, we still have legal. a huge legal legal. Yeah. We still have a, a very large illegal industry yeah. that's going on that was much, much bigger than before um, right. this happened. I mean, certainly our county has had for years uh, hmm. illegal uh, grows, but not to the magnitude of what we're, what we're seeing at this point. So hmm. um, trying to figure out how we're going to ensure that we're funding our sheriff's department as well is a big priority. Yeah. And then not having regulations right. other than a ban. Correct. Uh, it's kind of kind of hard for the sheriff to... Uh, to do anything uh, because it takes a lot of work to yes. uh, to go on people's property yep. and and uh, it can be dangerous too. Yeah. And if you're in a, a deep black market environment, then it's even more dangerous because yep. you're not dealing with people that are just registered growers. Correct. Yeah. Yep. The, uh, okay, now uh, one of the problems not only in our county but all over California is uh, unfunded liabilities that have to do with pensions. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, of course, every county and city is struggling with it. Some are going bankrupt, mm -hmm. and uh, it, there needs to be a solution. And yet it's not quite clear or at least not agreeable on what that solution could be. Right. So um, this was something that I have um, spoken to for year after year after year, that right. our pension costs were going to skyrocket, um, and they were going to continue to go up, and then they were going to stay at a very high level. Um, I estimated that they would be double. Um, from where they were, and I'm correct. It, I, it wasn't a crystal ball. It was common sense and paying attention to what was um, happening um, at CalPERS. I think you announced that on our program. I, I did. And so it is happening. So the yeah. bills are coming. And so trying to figure out how do we get ahead of that. And so what we have done is we um, talked to the Board of Supervisors and discussed the possibility of doing, uh, looking at um, an IRS 115 plan. Basically, it's a pension stabilization um, plan that would give us an opportunity to potentially outpace CalPERS returns. And at least we, you know, would be able to take some funds that we have set aside for our own internal pension stabilization that are in our treasury today that are making less than a percent of interest and being able to take them out of our treasury, put them into a trust outside of our of our own treasury and make 4%. What is what is uh CalPERS earning on their invested funds? Well, they say, <laughs> uh, they, you know, included in the actuary that we, um, that we work with, uh, that CalPERS gives us, and they include in their actuary numbers, um, they say, you know, seven and a half, they're going to drop it to seven and a quarter, and there's even been discussions that they'll drop it to um, seven or six and three quarters. The reality is when you look at what PERS has made, you know, some years it was negative two, some years it was one, some years it was 12, some, but not very many of those years was it ever that high. Right. It generally is not meeting the target that they include in that actuary. So at this point, um, and especially given the fact that um, the, you know, the, the bond market kind of fell apart we're not you know there's we're just not earning that much money in our own treasury right. it, it's making money where we're not losing money 
and we are um, making sure that the, the funds that we do have in our treasury are very protected from an operational perspective. Right. But from a, from a what do we do in order to help alleviate some of the strains of this pension, you know, skyrocketing pension costs, right. the IRS 115 is, is a really good first step. It's not the only step. So we have a committee that includes, um, that's going to be including two board members, myself, the treasurer, the CAO, um, I'm trying to think who else might be on there. I can't remember. Uh, in order to talk about this, because it is a real, um, it's going to be a real uh, detrimental problem if we don't deal with it. And I think that one of the options is the IRS 115, but it's also having more wide discussions, making sure that um, changes that we make um, are not going to cause increases to our unfunded liability. You know, that we may have to um, add different, you know, different types of compensation uh, that is not directly related to PERS. All of those things are going to have to come into play. And I think ultimately there has to be a statewide um, legislative change. Oh, good. <laughs> That's going to be hard. <laughs> it, it will be, but the good news is it's not just Calaveras County. When right. you start having, you know, very large counties um, that are going to be struggling just as badly as we are, yeah. who are going to find it extremely difficult to provide service and pay their pension, right. that's when people start talking. And that's when, um, in the state of California, it's also a member of CalPERS. Right. They're going to have a very difficult time affording this. Um, in the latest uh, governor's proposal for the um, for the budget, there was a whole section related to trying to make um, efforts to pay that unfunded liability at the state, and it's just a drop in the bucket. The reality is, at this point, um, CalPERS has a lot of leverage to not make agreements with agencies that want to get out of CalPERS. And so um, there is no incentive for um, counties or cities to be able to make alternative, um, uh, you know, pension or, um, or retirement plans outside of PERS if you're in PERS. So I think that um, it's going to take probably a major shift um, with state legislation and a major push on CalPERS to really um, kind of reform pension. I think PEPRA was, it, it was a, a, a start, but it was a very small um, start, the Pension Reform Act that did go through. So that's ultimately what's going to probably fix it. Um, but in the meantime, we're having a lot of discussions and we're meeting to talk about what we can do locally, which is not a ton because you have to have money <laughs> in order to do it. But at least there are some uh, changes that we can make here. The negotiations that that uh, go on in secret <clears throat> uh, between uh, government employee unions and the Board of Supervisors, um, perhaps there could lie a key in restructuring at the local level. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Howard Jarvis Taxpayer Association, uh, uh, John Coppell, mm -hmm. has repeat, repeatedly re said over and over again, we're using the wrong basis. We're, we're using uh, specified benefits. Mm -hmm. When you use specified benefits, there's no there's no end. Right. Uh, if you use specified um, contributions, mm -hmm. like the contributions from the employer or the yep. county, then the county can do its budget. And it may be due to circumstances of, uh, of uh, return on investment or, or the uh, retirees may not get as much as they otherwise would. Correct. But it's really their money and their responsibility. And they can control the investment outcomes and the yeah. investment um, decisions on how they're going to do that. And so that's also something to look at. Unfortunately, at this point, how CalPERS is established is that if we wanted to make that change, um, if you said, if you went to CalPERS and said, I would like to terminate our contract with CalPERS, um, we want to take the money that we have and take it out and do something different with it, they would charge you an astronomical termination. You have to pay for the entire... You have to pay uh, for the entire thing. Uh, unfunded and, liability up and, front. And not 
the current value of the unfunded liability, what the unfunded liability would be without the um, the seven and a half or seven and a quarter return on investment that is projected out from right. here to eternity, which may not be real. So it, no, and so it it be it just balloons, and so no one can do it. No one can pay for that. So that's where there's going to have to be um, a definite shift in in legislature on making that change. What approach would be best for the taxpayers to uh, <clears throat> to use with the board of supervisors to encourage them? to um, uh, act more responsibly at the local level. But is there, is there something, is there perhaps uh, an association or a group besides uh, uh, John Capel and the Howard Jarvis Taxpayer Association, is there anything else that could be used as an example that, that, that the Board of Supervisors could use as a standard when they sit down with the unions in their secret meetings? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, at this point, it, I, I think we're doing a good first step in this is the first time we've actually had an advisory committee, including two supervisors, to even discuss pension. Prior to that, it's me kind of voicing my concerns, yelling from the rooftops, we have a problem. And either the board will listen to it or they won't. Here comes that lady again. Right. Here she <laughs> comes with more bad news. So um, th this is promising because we actually can sit down and have a dialogue and we um, can bring, you know, um, experts in to say, look, she, she's right. Yeah. You know, and here's the numbers, and here's what's going to happen, and here's why it's happening, and here are some options that you can move forward with. So I, I think that's a really good first step, and I think that, you know, we kind of scared them enough that they know it, something bad is, is happening, and they mm -hmm. can see it on the horizon. And so I think that that's going to allow us to have some good discussions and hopefully have some positive outcomes and, and make some changes that are going to happen relatively soon. And my point to them is these are not discussions that we can keep talking about for the next five years. Right. Um, D-Day is happening before the five can, years. The can, so, the can won't kick anymore. No. So <laughs> we have to have these discussions now and we have to have um, implementations in immediately. New budget software. Mm -hmm. Two minutes. Yep. So we, um, I don't know if you were watching, but we did approve some new budget software for the county. Um, I think this is really going to help the taxpayers. And one mm -hmm. of the complaints I know that you have had and a lot of taxpayers have had is that our budget is really complicated and it's just really hard to follow. Hard to, yeah. It's um, <clears throat> it's not user friendly. Unfortunately, that is the model that the state controller puts forward to us. Right. But th the software is going to give us an opportunity to have a better dialogue with the taxpayer. Um, be able to explain our narratives, why we're doing something, what it looks like, and I think that it's going to make a lot more sense to the taxpayers. So I'm really looking forward to it. Um, we should have that implemented for the next budget cycle for the 1819 budget, um, and so we will have that up and running um, in, in that period of time. So um, look forward to that next budget. I think you're really going to like it. Mm, that's cool. What, uh, what was the cost of it, by the way? Um, Roughly. Well, it's expensive, <laughs> but um, I, I think when we looked at it, I have to go back to the board meeting, but when we looked at it, it, it it's, it's saving us um, it's saving us money in order to do this. And I think that the importance is that the taxpayer is going to be able to actually understand what it is that we're doing instead of thinking that some conspiracy is going on that <laughs> isn't really happening. And not uh, like Alpers. Exactly. We're so delighted to have you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for having guest. me. And thank you for watching Taxpayer Alert. See you next time.